There is a liturgy. I want to begin our time of worship today saying together. It's very simple. You probably have said this before. I will begin by saying God is good, and then you'll respond all the time. Then I will say all the time, and you respond God is good. We'll do that two times as we begin our time of worship. So God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Again, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. We do believe in God's goodness, His faithfulness to us, but sometimes that is hard to experience His goodness when, the, when we are in the midst of suffering. So today, we're going to look at God's goodness even when we are struggling and have disappointments. So you're invited to come and worship God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength as we worship Him in spirit and truth this day. Tender whisper of love in the 
Jesus tells us that when we are weary and we are carrying heavy burdens, that we are to come to him and he will give us rest. He also tells us that when we come to him, that he will give us a peace that passes all understanding, that will guard our hearts and minds. So prayer is just that opportunity for us to come and share with him the heavy burdens that we are carrying and allow his presence to bring a peace to us. So I invite you to pray with me during this time. O oh God, you hold all things together and you make all things new. We come to you tired. Our bodies are weary, our minds are flooded, and our hearts are overwhelmed. We wonder where you are in these turbulent times that have overloaded our bodies and minds and souls. O oh God, you are the one who illuminates the darkness. Help us to smash the heavy idols that we hold so that we may live freely and lightly in Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us to be gentle with ourselves and with one another as we walk through our days. And as we go, help us to, to discern what to enter into and what we might need to step away from. Oh God, you are larger than life, and yet you come to care for every sparrow, and you know every single hair that's on our heads. Help us to cling to you in these days of unknowing, and that we would trust you to lead us to rest. That when our inner and outer worlds seem overwhelming, and when we have experienced your peace, that we may enter into the work of creating a more just and a more peaceful and a more equitable world that you have given to us. And so hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You have given so generously to our church, and because of that, we have been able to be generous to the ministries that we care about. We have made an impact in our uh, community of Hanson with our food pantry, with our backpack blessings, with our angel tree in this last month. Over 2020, the year of the pandemic and so much uncertainty, you went above and beyond and we were able to bless many ministries and many opportunities to uh, care for those that are in need. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Oh!
Sunday in January, and I know that some of you will start back to school this coming week, and I'll be praying for you and everybody that is involved in the school system. Hope everything goes great for you and you stay safe. This morning to begin children's sermon, I'm going to read from God's Holy Word, and God's Holy Word is the Bible, and this morning I'm going to share with you John chapter 2 verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now when I read that passage of scripture and it talked about signs, all of these things together just happened to remind me of a story. First of all, I'm going to ask you a question. How do you know when it's time for your garden to grow and blossom. Well, first of all, the weather gets warm, and then uh, the weather gets warm, and the sun stays out longer, the birds begin to sing, and their little green shoots come up from the earth, and the buds on the trees and our flowers begin to grow and bloom, and the earth just comes alive. It's just waking up, and plants are getting ready to blossom and grow. And another question, how can you tell if a person is sad or happy? Well, you look at their face and see if they have a smile or if they have a, round, a frown. And <clears throat> you listen to the words that come out of their mouth. If their words are kind or if they're unkind or if they're friendly or unfriendly. And you can also tell a lot about a person by looking at their posture and we can tell by how they get around some people are just full of energy and others act like they're tired and these are just some of the signs that help, that help us to know what another person may be feeling so we see signs in nature and in other people that help us understand what is happening now and what might happen in the future and the Bible gives us signs too that helps us to understand who Jesus is. And one story tells about a miracle Jesus performed at a wedding in Cana. And at that time, the water in a lot of those places was not clean to drink, so a lot of people drank wine. And Jesus was at a wedding, and his mother was also there. And his mother Mary came up to him and said, Jesus, we're about to run out of wine. And Jesus asked that six large stone jars be filled with water. 
and then asked some to be drawn out. And sure enough, the water in the stone jars had been turned into wine. And this was the first of the miracles Jesus performed. And he did this as a sign that he was the Son of God. And the Bible tells us that when the disciples saw what he had done, they believed. So I want you to look around at the beautiful things in nature and the love that comes from others and see what signs you find that point to God. Then believe. I believe. Do you? Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son and for the miracle of salvation. Amen. As we consider this day, God's goodness in our life, no matter what the circumstances of our life may be. We want to read Jesus' words, words that he spoke to his disciples on the last night of his life here on earth, that tell of a lot of promises that we can hold on to, that tell us of God's goodness. So hear these words. Jesus asks, Do you finally believe? But the time is coming. Indeed, it is here now when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we invite you and your Holy Spirit and your word to come into a place. Uh, your word is a lamp to our feet, a light into our path, that you would come and illuminate our hearts and minds so that we can see you, we can know you, so we can serve you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I was in seminary the first time I heard the liturgy, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. And I remember going to my home church and, and speaking to them uh, about my experience in seminary and kind of giving them an update of where I was in my call to ministry and using that very liturgy. God is good all the time. And at that time, I realized I, could, I believed that. I, I could say it with such confidence. But I also know that up until that point, my life had been pretty good. It was easy to say that God was good because life was good. But often, life is not good. We, we experience a heartache and pain. And are we able to say, even in the midst of the suffering, that indeed God is good all the time. I remember in July of 2004, I sat in a pew on Sunday evening. We had Sunday evening church in the church that I was serving at the time, and we were having a hymn sing, and so different people were uh, calling out hymns that they wanted to sing, and we would sing the songs, and yet I just could not sing that night. I, I could not uh, bring myself because my heart was broken. I, I was experiencing a deep grief and sorrow and disappointment, and I just could not muster up anything. So I just sat in that service and cried and allowed the words that other people believed and sang to just reign over me, to sing over me. The reason for my heartache was um, I had just miscarried our third child. My husband and I had had two beautiful boys, healthy boys. I had good pregnancies, easy pregnancies, and, and we were expecting our third and, and had just told our family and was looking forward to what life was going to be like 
um, with a third child, and we had hopes and dreams. I was already p- making plans for n- the nursery and, and what things would be like, what life would be like when this little one arrived, when suddenly my body uh, began to change and a trip to the emergency room confirmed what we feared, that I was miscarrying this baby. And I sat on that Sunday night when my brokenness and my broken heart trying to remember that indeed God is good all the time, even in this moment of heartache. This is the question that many unbelievers ask. Many people um, of faith and those who don't have faith. How can you proclaim a, a God who is good, who is loving, who is faithful when tragedy happens, when suffering occurs, when life does not turn out like we thought? How can you say that indeed God is good? Over these last few weeks, we've looked at the God that Jesus reveals, not just because of what we want to believe, but who did God, who did Jesus reveal God the Father was? That indeed he's trustworthy and that he is love. And today we'll look at how he showed that he was good. On this night that Jesus was giving himself up for us, on this night that he gathered with his disciples, he'd washed their feet. He had uh, ate a meal with them, and he was teaching them, reminding them of the things he wanted them to know and to uh, be affirmed in. And part of that, he said, is that you will have sufferings, you will have trials, you will have troubles in this life. We, We don't like to think about that, do we? He tells us in, in the Sermon of the Mount how he, um, as he calls us to love our enemies, he says that God gives the sunlight to both the evil and the good, and that he sends the rain on the just and the unjust alike, that all of us will have su- suffering. We will all have trials. We'll all have sorrows, and just because we believe in Christ does not make us immune to that. We would love to have this invisible shield around us that protected us from tragedy. We, we would love for that to protect us around the heartache. But we do not get a, a get-out-of-suffering free pass just because we believe in Jesus. In fact, he, he explicitly says you will have trouble. You will have sorrows. You will have trials in this life. We want to believe that that's not true, but it is. And our faith has to work through that truth. That good things happen to good people and to people who we consider evil. That bad things, tragedy happens to both good people, people of faith, people who believe, people who try to live in the right way and obey the law. And then bad things also happen to people who don't seek to live in such ways. We may never understand why God God allows such suffering to happen, such trials to happen. Jesus told the disciples that he would no longer be with them, that um, it would be best for him to go away, and they didn't understand that. In fact, they said, what does he mean? We, We just don't understand. That's exactly how we feel at times in suffering. We don't understand what you mean by this. We don't understand why this is happening. We just don't understand. We don't understand why young people, their bodies develop autoimmune diseases. 
that affects their health. We don't understand why cancer continues to run rampant in, in our bodies at times. We don't understand why a young, loving couple is not able to have children. We don't understand why this virus affects some people in, in tragic ways and not other people's body. We don't understand a lot about suffering and why it happens and, and when it happens and how it happens. But this we do know, that we are able to affirm that indeed God is good all the time, even in the midst of suffering. And we can say that with confidence, not a blind faith, but because we have lived it and experienced it, and we know it to be true, and because that is who Jesus revealed to us as God the Father. Remember in our scripture, he says, The time is coming, indeed it is here now, when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. The first reason we can say that God is indeed good, even in the midst of our suffering, is because he promises that he is with us. Jesus, knowing that he was going to the cross, knowing that his disciples would fall asleep, knowing that they would scatter and they would abandon him in his darkest hour, he says, it's okay because the Father is with me. Even though he doubted that on the cross where he cried out, God, why have you forsaken me? He knew in this moment that God would be with him. Often that is what we want, right? Is for someone to just be with us in the midst of the suffering. I remember on that Sunday night when my heart was so broken and tears continued to fall as many sang around the sanctuary that an older lady seeing my tears, not knowing why or what was going on, just came and sat beside me. She just came and sat. She didn't say anything. She didn't offer any words. She just sat and was with me. Jesus told his disciples, I will not abandon you as orphans. No, I will come to you. And he promises the Holy Spirit to come to be with us, to live in us so that we are never alone. The second reason why we could say God is good is because he is able to bring joy and peace even in the midst of suffering. He tells the disciples, very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain, but her time has come. And when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because her joy in that child is born into the world. So with you, now your time is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one can take away your joy. He said, I'm telling you all of this so that you will have peace in me. He says earlier, peace I leave with you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Jesus offers us the gift that no one else is able to give. And that is the gift of peace and even joy in the midst of suffering and trials and heartaches. That we can say God is good because he gives to us those things with his presence. A couple weeks ago, a good friend, a mentor of ours, Mike, um, went to be with Jesus and over these last few weeks, I've been reflecting on our time together, our friendship, and the things that he taught us. And 
I'll never forget that one of the very first conversations when he came to be the senior pastor of the church where I was serving was about a time that he had just experienced, a season he and his wife Mildred had just gone through. Mildred had breast cancer, and she'd undergone surgeries and chemo and radiation, and, and Mike shared with us that he would not wish that terrible season that they went through on anyone, how difficult it was. But with tears running down his face, he said, But I am closer to the Lord than I've ever been before. I have known his presence and his peace in a greater, more intimate way than I ever would have known had we not gone through that difficult season. Our suffering allows us to draw closer to him if we allow him to, for us to know his joy and his peace, even in the midst of our suffering. The third thing that we can be confident of, that God is good, even in the midst of our suffering, is that it's just temporary. Our sufferings here on earth is just temporary. Jesus began this time with his disciples with these words, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. And if, I, if that were not so, would I, t- would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that you may be where I am. You know the place where I am going. We often say those words at funerals. They are words of such comfort and promise and hope that indeed this life, though it seems long at times and it seems difficult at times, is just a blip in the time of eternity. And that these sufferings that we have will not compare to the glory that one day we will know. That God has something bigger and greater in mind for us beyond this life. And that we can hold on to that hope even in the midst of our suffering. The last promise that we have that God is good, even in the midst of our suffering, comes from Galatians 2.20. In the contemporary English version, it says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in my body, I live by faith, indeed, by the faithfulness of God's Son, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I live in Christ, and Christ lives in me, and we live by faith. In fact, often it's not our faith, but it's God's faith. It's Jesus' faith. Sometimes we cannot believe because the pain is too much. It's too hard. It's, It's too raw for us. That night, that Sunday night, I sat in that chapel, and heard the words of the hymns that I know and love and believe, it was just too much. I could not fully embrace all of that that evening. And yet, Jesus has faith for me when I don't. He has faith for you when maybe you don't. In this verse, it talks about we live by faith. And often we say faith in Jesus. That's what many of our translations might say. But the original says that we live by faith of Jesus. We live in his faith. That his faith is what carries us through. His faith in calling God a good God is what gets us through difficult times. Because Jesus faced suffering, and he faced rejection, and he faced alienation. And people jeered at him as he hung on the cross. And he even questioned whether God was with him, and yet Jesus believed. 
And because he believed, he carries faith for us, enough for us, when we don't have it. Christ lives in us, and we live in his faith, and we are not alone. We are never alone. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He never abandons us. He does not leave us as orphans. We can hold on to the promise that he will give us joy and peace, even in those difficult times. And we can affirm, indeed, that God is good all the time, because all the time, God is indeed good. So our scripture verse, we're being transformed each and every week by the word of God, by the spirit of God, and by the community of God. And so our scripture verse, the word of God for this week is, I have told you these things, Jesus said, so that in me you will have peace. And in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You can find this in John sixteen thirty three. Put it up in a place where you'll see it on a regular basis. Our spiritual practice, we're inviting the Spirit of God to work in us, is to remember that each person that we come in contact with are carrying burdens that we may never know. They're carrying heartaches, difficulties, trials, and we may never know what those are. But we want to invite the Spirit in to where th- what they are carrying and their heartaches. So I invite you that this week, one person that you come in contact with, this could be a co-worker, this could be a waiter or waitress, this could be a, uh, a cashier who's checking you out at the grocery store, this could be a neighbor, a friend, just to simply say, I'm praying for you this week. Is there anything specific you want me to pray about? If they respond yes and they tell you, then be faithful to pray for that person in that situation. If they say no thank you, then say okay. Just know that you are being prayed for this week by me. And allow the Spirit of God to enter into their time of difficulty in a way that maybe they may not have been aware of and allow you to be a part of what he is doing, showing his goodness and his faithfulness, that indeed he is loving and trustworthy to them as well. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For our benediction, hear these words. And now now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the time of Jesus Christ comes. And God will make this happen. For he who calls you is faithful. Amen.